Today, we have a pleasure to receive Adam Videra. Uh, he's a very good colleague of myself from the University of Münster. And uh, it's a really, really great pleasure to have here, to have him here. And uh, I spent one year in Münster with Adam at the chair of Professor Hallingrad from uh, 2014 to 2015. And uh, yeah, uh, I would like to also thank Adam for making the time. I know that it's five hours, uh, you are five or four hours ahead. So this means that uh, in Germany is 8 p.m., 8, 10 p.m. And uh, yeah, you, you, have, you have kids, you are in the pandemic. So thank you very much for making this time and uh, coming here to, to show and uh, to show your experience, explain about the, the driver project, which is quite nice, and uh, discuss a little bit about socio-technical and crisis management, which is, a, a, by the way, which is an area uh, of research that I'm still working on. And uh, we had we shared a lot of stuff uh, while I was uh, in Minister. So thank you very much, Adam. And uh, yeah, so the talk is going to be about practitioner-centered assessment of social-technical innovations in crisis management, inside from driver plus demonstration project. So again, I would like to thank you for uh, for making the time and coming here. It's always good to you know to be in touch with you, uh, to see what's going on in the disaster risk and crisis management uh, uh, research. And I know that you from Minister are doing like a high level uh, research. And uh, yeah, so it's going to be really good to hear you. And as we say here, the floor is yours. You're free to share your slides. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Lavio. And thank you very much, also, Alishan. Um, yeah, so really the pleasure is mine, um, especially since we have uh, with the University of Sao Paulo quite a strong relationship. We will see in a couple of minutes. Uh, and of course, with you, Flavio, we did quite a lot of, uh, uh, we, we did have quite a lot of interesting time in Münster and also on several occasions where we presented our research on press management. I will just start right away so that we don't lose any time. I hope you can all see the slides now. Yep. Yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. Uh, welcome, welcome, or cold welcome would be the correct uh, language, uh, taking the temperatures here in, in Münster into account. Uh, so my name is Adam. Uh, I'm working at the University of Münster uh, for the research group of Bernd Henningwart. Maybe some of you know him um, in the ERTS headquarters uh, in Münster. Uh, yeah, and I had the pleasure to coordinate the Driver Plus project uh, from the University of Münster side, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share our experiences of this uh, really unique large-scale uh, demonstration project. Uh, so, um, as you can imagine, there is quite a lot to say and show about a project which uh, started in May 2014 and uh, ended just uh, in June this year. Um, and so my goal will be to give you a short explanation on why Driver Plus was needed from the European crisis management perspective. Um, I will uh, try to present an uh, overview of the main outcomes and to share um, unfortunately, only some uh, insights from uh, what Drive Plus is actually uh, all about, which is doing trials in which innovations are assessed as socio-technical systems in a practitioner-centered uh, setup. Uh, yeah, but first things first, here is the uh, short agenda. Flavio asked me to tell also a little bit about our group here. Uh, so I added some slides and I hope this will not crash the time management, but uh, I think it's good to know maybe we can uh, see uh, potential correlations with each other. Uh, then I will uh, dive deeper into the Driver Plus project. Uh, we'll close with the uh, insight of a Driver Plus trial, and then I'm looking forward to a discussion with you. Okay, so introduction. You will hear a couple of uh, abbreviations like IS and SEM, WWU, and uh, I hope that after these couple of slides, you will know more about it. So sorry for the flipbook like uh, self introduction, but I don't want to steal too much time from the real content of the talk. Um, so um, I'm working for the group of Bernd Hellingrad, who is responsible for the group on information systems and supply chain management. And I will go now step by step. So you see on the top left, that's the um, WWU, which is the German term, the Swedish Wilhelms University of Münster. Uh, that's the University of Münster. Um, there is a department of information systems, and within this department, we have a couple of uh, research groups, and one is the group for information systems and supply chain management. Also, there is this access, which I will also uh, talk a bit about in a couple of minutes. So, uh, for those who did not visit Germany uh, uh, before, um, the um, university is quite old. Uh, there is some uh, discussion about when it really started. Uh, I don't want to touch on this, uh, but in the year 1990, the uh, Department of Information Systems has been founded, uh, surprisingly, at the um, Münster School of Business and Economics. Um, 
And uh, yeah, we have eight professors, of, which hold uh, each of them a this group, for instance, covering areas like information management, practical computer science, and what you see in this uh, red box here, that's our group, supply chain uh, management uh, and information systems. Um, what uh, we are covering in our uh, teaching is uh, basically on the bachelor level operations management and supply chain logistics and management. Um, currently, actually, the course on supply chain logistics management is uh, given by a Brazilian colleague of us, uh, Felipe Escarvalho. Uh, I, I guess some of you know him. Um, and on master level, our main focus is on supply chain management and enterprise architecture management. We do quite a lot of uh, project seminars with industrial partners like uh, DB Schenker or um, Audi or Volkswagen, uh, to name only a few of them. And within our research group, we have three areas which we are covering, and that is uh, the one that we will talk about today, supply chain crisis management and security. But then we do also have uh, some research ongoing in the area of supply chain digitalization and supply chain integration. Actually, the integration part is something which we cover quite a lot with our Brazilian partners um, in the area of uh, sales and operations planning. Okay. Then you have seen this icon here, so ANSYS, right? What does it stand for? It's the European Research Center for Information Systems. Um, and that is a network that has been uh, founded in, I think, 2005 if, uh, or four, if I, yeah, exactly, 2004, uh, which became a huge network. And um, we do have uh, uh, also several partners um, beyond Europe. And one of them is the University of Sao Paulo. So I just added the map here with all the members we have. So you see, we have some in Australia, uh, but also the US. And here you see the Sao Paulo guys. So that's where you should now enjoy the, the good weather. Um, Sao Paulo joined actually because Bernd um, is also responsible for the Brazilian center that we have at the University of Münster. He's the head of this. Um, so here, if you go to the University of Münster website, you will uh, hopefully uh, uh, quickly uh, reach the Centro Brasileiro. I, I'm not sure if that was correctly pronounced, but um, this is our activities which we have not only with Sao Paulo, but also with many other um, universities uh, in Florianopolis, uh, Recife, and so on and so forth. So um, there are quite a lot of opportunities to exchange students, but also uh, postdocs, etc. And uh, coming back to the access slide, and this is then almost it about the self-introduction. Um, there are so-called competence centers. Competence centers are founded whenever uh, some research groups um, are uh, doing quite a lot of uh, research in one particular area, such as, for instance, e-government or smarter work. And one of them is the crisis management, which I am happy to be the managing director of. Uh, it was funded in uh, 2013. And from this group, uh, um, we came also to the Dry Plus project. And at this stage, I would like to finish the self-introduction and now dive deeper into the um, Dry Plus presentation. So, um, but also, if you are interested in all kinds of exchanges, whatever it is, uh, um, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Bernd or me. Uh, we really do quite a lot of exchange, physical exchange, uh, as long as there is no pandemic uh, uh, situation that we have right now. Uh, so please contact me if you are planning to uh, uh, to stay here for a while and do some research in Germany. Okay, but now let's go to the area of crisis management and the way how information systems are perceived there. Um, so we all have seen the impacts of uh, societal disruptions for our communities uh, um, all around the world. From the high increase of weather-related hazards or terrorist attacks up to armed conflicts, everything is uh, can be, you know, on a daily basis uh, checked in the media. And I would say that since COVID-19, everyone in the world can experience directly how important health and security related disruptions for our societies are and how substantial crisis management preparedness and response are. So at the same time, it is obvious that crisis management is not an island, but it is embedded in our socio technical systems. So technological progress offers new solutions, which all of these practitioners are aware of. But for such a sensitive application domain, this uptake is a challenge in itself. There have been many uh, really impressive, uh, you know, fails uh, in the past. Like, I think in 2003, for instance, um, a, a report by Delcher and Genos uh, concluded that um, IS failures in Western Europe um, in the area of crisis management uh, were able to sum up to 140 billion damages. Uh, just 
10 years ago, we had a fire control uh, project um, in the UK, uh, which failed and was about 500 million pounds. So quite a lot. And I don't know how you perceive currently, for instance, um, well, the fast innovations in the area of pandemic management. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that, that could work better. So the question is how to provide robust and relevant assessment of information systems innovations for crisis management practitioners and um, how to answer um, the, the missing evidence on the added value of new solutions. Um, and the question is also when, when you look from the practitioner perspective, how to increase trust among the practitioners. So probably you have also seen in your private life there, there were quite a lot of innovations like, I don't know, Google Glasses or uh, smart home applications. And you probably, uh, you know, it took you some time until you said, okay, I'm going in. I'm buying this glass and trying this innovation. Um, and in this sensitive application domain, this is probably something different. And those were the guiding questions in the Driver Plus research proposal, which was written in the year 2030. So how did the Driver Plus consortium targeted to answer those questions? We mainly focused on capability development within the crisis management domain. And um, we came up with a way on how innovation management could work best. It's just one way. Um, and the first major starting point was to uh, not look at those solutions from the technology perspective. So whether uh, something is uh, robust, uh, cost efficient and effective, um, but to emphasize a needs driven perspective. So the questions, how can practitioners identify and qualify relevant gaps in their daily works in their crisis management realities? Later more on that, but let's first have a brief look on some key facts about the project and the, the partners involved. So um, the project, as I said, started in, in May 2014 uh, with uh, a, um, a consortium of practitioner organizations, research institutes, industries, as well as small and medium enterprises. Um, foremost, it was covered by crisis management practitioner, practitioners such as Red Cross societies from Austria, Israel or Denmark, emergency responders such, such as firefighters or police from France, the Netherlands or Poland. Um, and also crisis management uh, um, authorities, uh, for instance, from the Netherlands or the European Commission itself. Um, and then there were solution providers, which we needed to, to test whether new ways of assessing those information systems uh, worked or not. Um, so here, uh, those partners came from industry and research and played in quite different roles. So for instance, Hades Group is maybe uh, um, uh, rings a bell uh, for, for some of you, but there were also um, other organizations like, for instance, XVR, which is a commercial firefighter trainer organization, um, and uh, aerospace centers from Poland and Germany. Uh, yeah, and last but not least, there was one university in the whole project, which was the University uh, of Münster. And with 34 million uh, euro direct uh, contribution from the European Commission, the project size itself became a challenge, requesting all members to travel and make use of video conferences on a daily basis. So uh, sometimes we had with, within Münster uh, uh, situations where employees um, uh, didn't see each other in presence for more than three months uh, because we were on trainings, um, et cetera, quickly. Okay. So here are the objectives, um, which hopefully uh, help to, to enable an appropriate assessment and increase of crisis management innovations. Um, and there is one thing to say. So the three overarching objectives being to develop a pan-European testbed for crisis management capability development, a, a comprehensive portfolio of crisis management solutions, and to facilitate shared understanding. Um, the way how the term practitioner driven was operationalized has changed during the project. Um, based on an intermediate practitioner uh, and, and reviewer feedback, the project has been suspended for, I think, almost uh, one and a half years and uh, was requested to revise the way how practitioners are involved. And after an intense restructuring phase from June 2016 onwards, Driver became Driver Plus. That's why I'm referring to driver as driver plus. And the most important changes next to the fixed and revised deliverables we have to do in such research projects were to put the practitioners in the center of a mixed research approach, uh, which we use uh, to assess um, information systems innovations. And this came along with a high risk of directly involved uh, solution providers, especially whose participations in the assessments became a serious question or risk 
as the call for applications has been extended to internal and external providers, being reviewed by practitioner criteria through the practitioner itself. So we had a description of work in which everyone, every partner was able to, um, uh, to foresee when the solution would be tested and uh, so on and so forth, but this has changed. Um, actually, what we did apply was a, uh, something that, that you all probably know from, from um, a conference uh, or journal publications. Uh, we did a double blind review, which was uh, facilitated by the group in Münster, um, but fully executed by crisis management practitioners. So, and in the following, I will present step by step the main delivered artifacts for each of those three objectives. I have seen in the meanwhile that there are some issues with the uh, audio quality. Is it uh, better? Should I be a little bit? Should I should I slow down or is it okay? From, from my side, is yeah. okay. Then. Oh, Adam. I can I can hear you clear. Okay. Thank you. Then then I just go ahead. So I start with uh, present, presenting the main delivered artifacts, um, and it's quite important to mention for those of you who are interested in in picking this up that all of them are open source uh, and licensed under the Creative Commons scheme. So the first objective was to develop a pan-European tester for crisis management. Um, and the three main elements were a proper methodology that uh, allows this uh, kind of you know, functioning of such a testbed, a technical testbed infrastructure, which we need in order to simulate uh, these kind of scenarios, um, and last but not least, the training module, which facilitates uh, the, the uptake from the practitioner organization side. So the first thing, the trial guidance methodology, um, was um, not only the methodology itself, but it was also uh, a challenge to find a pragmatic and systematic support of practitioners. So the main idea was to develop a methodology which enabled practitioners to design, execute, and analyze the trials by themselves. When I say trials, it's a kind of an event in which those solutions are tested. Um, it was all built on the driver foundation. We used some uh, um, uh, a dedicated methodology, which comes from the military domain called uh, concept development and experimentation approach. But we also learned from the first part of driver. And uh, finally, as the university, we suggested to, to follow a, a rigor systematic literature review to see what kind of elements in such trials should be uh, contained. Um, and it is important to mention that the major innovation here was to connect a classical assessment like uh, technological readiness uh, uh, levels or usability assessments with the actual crisis management operations um, in terms of, for instance, objective performance changes um, in, in a certain operation, but also the perception of the, uh, the practitioners, so how they perceive certain tools. Um, the way how the methodology is to be presented was actually born in uh, the design thinking lab at Le Leonardo Campus uh, in Münster uh, in December 2018. And it followed an agile iteration of uh, by practitioners with and beyond the Driver Plus project, which was really nice. So, and after 10 iterations, the final version has been delivered in September 2019, so a little bit more than one year ago. Um, and um, I, I just write it down here. So if you would like to, to get a printed copy, please uh, send me an email. Uh, there are still uh, some copies left, uh, first come, first serve. Um, yeah, there is also an interactive website, and I'm happy uh, to say that the ERTS is uh, committed to maintain the access and further development uh, um, on our side, which is really a great achievement and makes us stay also close to the practitioner networks. Okay. So then there was the technical part of the pan-European testbed. So we needed an IT environment which was able to create realistic trialing environment and support those trials. Um, this result can be fully checked on GitHub. You just have to enter driver plus on GitHub and you will uh, uh, land there. I think that two major elements is a common information space, which is the, the yellow uh, box in here, and the common simulation space. So. Uh, while the common information space is connected to the solutions which are tested, so when, with a solution I can think of a common operational picture, for instance, um, and the simulators are needed in order to simulate a certain uh, uh, situation, like flooding or uh, um, an evacuation, for example. Then we needed, of course, also something like a trial management tool, which was able to you know, um, um, play the whole uh, scenario. Um, and we also had a couple of tools like an observer support tool where all this information and data could be uh, gathered and, and stored, and also an after action review tool which helped us with the analysis of the results. 
So um, this is a screenshot of the uh, GitHub, um, and there are how many? I think something around yeah, 63 repositories placed there, and you can have a look and play around. Maybe you find an opportunity where where this is needed, so this is this can be easily picked up and also change according to your needs. Um, so now, as you know, open source products also uh, have risks because uh, if you don't own it, you probably don't maintain this, these things. Um, so what happened here is that um, we were thinking about an organizational setup that um, enables uh, those solutions not to be, um, well, uh, forgotten um, so that they do not work. And therefore, uh, what we created was, uh, uh, sorry, so-called centers of expertise. Um, which uh, took up all those results, and they are now, uh, for instance, using and really maintaining all those solutions which I have just described. And the last part was the training module. Um, that is something for everyone here uh, from academia, you know what I'm talking about. So there, there is no such a thing like, you know, methodology that stands for, for its own. You need uh, good introductions on how this works out, and especially if you have a very diverse uh, target audience. Uh, I'm talking about the crisis management practitioners here. Uh, we really have to think of, you know, what, how to, to customize such a training. So we looked at different target groups like the organizers and practitioners, but also the solution providers and last but not least the technicians who had to connect those solutions, for instance, in order to make them run in the simulation. And we have really, you know, we did um, e-lectures, quizzes, animations, and they are all available, uh, currently maintained by one of those centers of expertise, which is the Estonian Academy of Security Sciences. They also, Flavio, you were talking about Moodle. So we have a Moodle for all these uh, things and people can go there, can register um, um, and can uh, uh, go through all these uh, things. Yeah, so that's the that's the icon of the Estonian Academy uh, um, of uh, Security Services. And here you see all these fancy videos we did for this e-learning session so that people can learn by themselves whenever they have the time. Okay, then there is another thing which is probably interesting for those of you who are also working in crisis management uh, uh, um, area. Uh, um, this is a so-called portfolio of crisis management solutions. Um, so since innovations still need to be provided also outside the crisis management domain, setting up a standardized uh, portfolio of solutions was obvious to us. Um, the interesting part is certainly here that the, we uh, developed a crisis management taxonomy uh, by crisis management practitioners, which uh, if you enter this portfolio of solutions, um, uh, is used to describe and classify each of those solutions. So if you go, if you have a solution, I don't know, something with uh, open street map, for instance, uh, for uh, um, uh, crisis mapping, um, you can uh, uh, really step by step easily describe the solution, what it is all about, um, and you can access all this stuff. Um, it um, went uh, um, a little bit slowly in the beginning, but currently it's really exploding. And the good news is here that um, also we found another organization which committed to maintain this portfolio of solutions, which is um, basically a website with a database, um, and that's the Disaster Competence Network in Austria, and they are supported by the developers of the Austrian Institute of Technology. And if you are interested in this kind of solutions, please just go and visit this website. It's, it's really nice to see what is already out there, and I think it can grow much broader and it can go beyond Europe. Okay, um, the last thing might come, you know, for information systems, researchers probably a little bit like, okay, that's not really needed, it's just a uh, cosmetic thing. Uh, but what we learned is that this kind of community building is more than just a cosmetic dissemination task. It actually is much more than this. So if the crisis management community, which of course existed before Driver Plus, is not adequately connected, um, even the best artifacts are not recognized and used uh, by the practitioners. And this is why the third objective played a major role in the success of the project. So we have developed mainly three big outcomes. The first one was the so-called c, uh, c um, which is a community of practice. Uh, um, it was the, I would call it a connection to the installed base, uh, a, a term that is uh, frequently used also in IS research. We have seen that the crisis management community was kind of distributed in several specific sub-communities. And we identified that they missed a certain virtual space to get together, so CMIME was born. Um, and also here, we found a very nice organization, which is the Resilience Advisors Network coming from UK. I, I can imagine that Joao uh, Porto is probably connected with them. Um, this is a formal uh, um, network of more than 100 uh, resilience and civil protection experts from uh, Europe, all experienced directors and leaders in their own right. 
um, and uh, they bring uh, um, the strengths uh, uh, of you know many different actors, um, and uh, they are very well connected with the sub-crisis management communities, um, both on a geographic uh, basis, if you want so, but also uh, content-wise. So um, th th this was a really nice uh, uptake uh, by Ram. And the other thing were the already mentioned centers of expertise. Those were practitioner organizations, um, which were kind of coming from an academic area. So in crisis management, there is quite a lot of universities and academies out there which help to uh, train practitioners. Uh, so um, we have seen here as well. So there is no action without dedicated commitment. And um, this was the result of the methodological group to, to come up with um, uh, the idea that we need kind of organizations who really say we want to foster this kind of trialing. Um, so, and they did, so the, the dissemination part, uh, group in the project did a great job, I think, in defining rights and duties for this kind of organizations, because you kind of have to say, okay, if you want to support practitioner organizations in doing such trials, you also need to do something. You have to commit to have certain amount of people who are helping uh, practitioners uh, in setting up such trials. So um, th they developed something like a toolkit describing you know, what kind of resources are needed, what kind of uh, facilitations you need within your organization. Um, and uh, that, that was for me uh, really surprising at the end of project. We had uh, um, this uh, center of expertise coming from Poland, Estonia, Lithuania, Austria, Belgium and France. Um, and um, I, I can really imagine that, you know, this is kind of the, the right multiplicator effect which you need for a proper community building. And last but not least, we had one uh, standardization organization in the consortium and they said also, okay, standards are also helpful when it comes to uh, uh, spreading the word, if you want so. Um, so um, they helped us uh, um, to get into the standardization community and uh, kind of, um, you know, transfer the results we had uh, to to this to the standardization area, um, and what we did was not going for full standards because the duration of the project was long, but not that as long as as a standard needs to be developed, uh, and so we went for something that is called um, a Zen Workshop Agreement. Zen stands for the European Committee for Standardization. It comes from France, so it's Committee European de Normalisation, um, and the um, um, Zen workshop agreements is simply a quicker alternative to formal standards and open to any experts, whether they are members of a technical committee or not. And what we have developed was actually four of this kind of projects. Uh, we, the University of Minsa, uh, have been heading the systematic assessment of innovative solutions for crisis management, being the trial guidance methodology. And yeah, that was an interesting output and is now you know stored in the standardization community. Okay, so. Um, this is more or less uh, um, the artifacts which were developed, but I was talking all the time about the trials, and I think for you it, 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 uh, it is now the time to really get into this, what, what is the trial? We will get there in a second. Um, so what we did is, um, was four regular trials in Poland, in France, in the Netherlands, in Austria, you see the dates uh, next to these uh, um, uh, names of the trials. And also we had something that was initially planned to be a final demonstration of the whole thing, but it ended up in a regular trial simply because we were really used to it and it was handy to do so. Um, so that is where we went. And we will uh, hear a little bit about the third trial, which is the trial in the Netherlands in the context of uh, a flooding scenario. Um, but that was uh, it uh, for the meantime when it comes to the, to the artifacts. So, to sum it up, what I can say as a, as a researcher, that was really, uh, you know, not the classical task that researchers have, uh, spending all the time in, in their offices uh, uh, on the table, but, you know, really go outside in the field. Uh, it was really, really uh, um, something new for many of, of, uh, of the people from, uh, from, from our team. Um, and also what was very nice to see um, how relevant the outcomes became. Um, if you see those practitioners who are, you know, experiencing for the first time a certain solution and they're coming to the conclusion, okay, I just take it up, I just use it in my daily work, that's really impressive, that, that's why we probably do uh, the stuff that we are doing. Um, however, this would not be possible without the consideration of the sustainability plan, so whenever, that's just, you know, my takeaway 
uh, for those of you who are doing research projects in, in this domain, think about it because it's really it's really important. Uh, um, uh, simply because of you know th that's what makes data coming over information to knowledge. That's how we create knowledge in the end. Um, and, and the funny thing is that actually we as researchers have quite a lot of power. So the fun fact now for Europe is that we really have firefighters or, or policemen in Europe running around applying business process modeling notation uh, to, to depict their, their work uh, practices by themselves. And, and that was quite, quite really a precious combination of desk and field research. So I promised you to, to share some insights of such a trial. And um, one of the, the uh, um, our research outcomes in the group, I'm not talking about the driver project now, but the, some of the um, crisis management research we are doing at the group of, of Bernd, <clears throat> was also selected to one of those trials, and that's why I picked the Netherlands one. Um, it would go too far to give you an overview of the whole trial and also to, uh, to present the, the, uh, the, the solution that has been selected by us, which was the, uh, a simulation tool. Um, maybe we organize another talk and I can present only this, this simulation approach, um, but I, uh, we, we created a quite nice uh, a short uh, movie about it and uh, I would like to share it with you. I hope that the quality is fine. I will just uh, play it and um, let's see what you can see or not see. Um, I will share the link afterwards. There is a YouTube channel and uh, you can always access it afterwards if you missed something, but I hope it's working, so keep the fingers crossed. Okay, there you go. All right, guys, let's get started. Um, we are about 31 hours before the storm will hit. This is a severe storm. Probably it will pass more than from the heavy rainfall, heavy winds. So inside in the springtime, we factored all these together to the chances of coastal defenses failing. Humanoxid uh, is a uh, solution dedicated for logisticians uh, in uh, humanitarian and um, other industrial organizations. It is a um, highly adjustable solution, so we have deployed it in very different scenarios, starting from a tsunami in the south of France and Lake Now, for instance, uh, which is about finding out. Um, how long does it take to evacuate um, a certain amount of people in a, in a big uh, area like the Hague and actually to set up and maintain IDP camps? Here are the more severe things that took people far longer to leave the city. We designed an exaggerated flooding scenario in order for us to uh, test many of the other solutions and also to involve uh, many organizations that are not also normally involved in that. Uh, our role as the VLR is to organize uh, one of these big European trials, so we are the trial owner together with safety in the day. And on the other hand, we are also solution providers. The main idea of the VLR are the system to combine the solutions to one current big solution. So the area of the most in the jury is able to produce a new and a current digital roadmap network, which we can use to reroute the ideas on. The KI generates two different kinds of methods. The one is mapping and 2D and uh, 3D the flood situation. And uh, the other product is extracting a flood layer and only sending the flood information to the other uh, solutions. These solutions can use the flood information coming from aerial imagery for making calculations. CCI stands for the simulating critical infrastructure. We uh, have a simulation platform in which different types of infrastructures uh, uh, integrate with each other. We calculate and simulate uh, the effects and the impacts on uh, electricity network, uh, transport, uh, etc. Our simulation is four dimensional, which means that we visualize three dimensional, but we also have the time size. And with the time size, you can foresee what's going to happen. And what you saw the last two days is that a lot of people use this time size to mitigate the risk they are having. Well, thank you, Bob. Yeah. Storm Andrew hit the Dutch coast and stormed the table. Seawater is flowing into the city of Liverpool. It's now 9 a.m. Most authorities feared what happened. Around 9 p.m. last night, the northwestern storm Andrew hit the Dutch coastline with wind force of wind. All right, people, we will start in three, two, one. Good luck, enjoy. This one, we were hit by a bit of a lot of steam here. In the end, the, the, the beach is uh, closed. This was not yesterday, but the evacuation zones 
the eight exception points and the short uh, location. Too. So the reason because the planning scenario is because the real threat of the climate occurring in the Netherlands. Um, a large part of the Netherlands is below sea level, and in 1953 we experienced a severe flood with many people being killed. Also, uh, we are facing climate change, uh, which leads to the rise of uh, sea water levels. So, although we have our coastal defenses at pretty high level, the chances of a flood are there, uh, and therefore we do need to prepare in case of flooding occurs. Require uh, it's a very uh, realistic scenario. Flooding. It's necessary to have these exercises uh, to experience what these applications can do for us. So it takes time, it takes a little bit of study, but it helps us develop price uh, Based on innovatie, elk in the over the toekomst van meer inzichtelijk te maken wat al speelt eigenlijk Niet alleen de overstroming zijn te zien, maar juist ook alle andere and that helps us to be able to do the work. So you see, almost uh, done. And I hope it was understandable. I see Alexandra is shaking the head, so it, it looks good. But for any reasons, I will share the link anyway. It's good to hear that, that it worked out. Um, so, um, just for your imagination now, uh, what you have seen was now the final execution of the trial. And there were something like nine to, I think, 11 months of preparation in order to do so. We have undergone quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tasks from, from planning, from getting all the solutions together, getting the practitioners on board, um, which was highly, um, I would say, uh, time intensively. Um, and at the same time, uh, the, the, the actual trial took one week. So we started on Monday and it was officially closed on, on, on Friday. So it's a whole working week, if you want so. But then the analysis started. And I can tell you that we are still sitting with gigabytes of data from all these uh, um, exercises, which we were not able um, uh, to process yet. So we are still working on it, uh, especially also on, on the thing that, that we were doing here. And just to give you some insights, I will, I will tell a little bit about this, this trial. Uh, really just not more than five minutes so that we have enough time to to discuss a bit um so the first thing um oh, sorry was that one so the solution that we have applied was a multi-method simulation tool uh, maybe some of you who are working with simulation uh, might know that the the, um, the software which is called any logic uh, it allows um, agent-based discrete event uh, uh, simulation and system dynamics and to the combination of them um, but um, we have prepared this simulation environment way in advance, as I said. I think we developed it somewhere around 2013, 2014. Um, so it was already operationalized in uh, um, uh, several cases. Um, but whenever we start this, uh, we first have to know who are we talking about. And that was the social technical perspective. So here we had to look at, okay, what kind of process data do we need? What kind of operational data do we need from those people? So the Haag London, what you have heard, is the area around the city of The Hague, which is probably one of the, next to Amsterdam, the most prominent city in, in the Netherlands. And um, so this is something we had to collect. We also had to look at the geographic data. Um, we needed uh, feedback from disaster relief logisticians from that area, but also things like, for instance, what is about the human behavior in, in such uh, flooding scenarios? And they are very dependent whenever wherever you look in the world. Uh, um, and so this is where we gathered all this, all this data. It took us uh, certainly um, more than six months um, uh, to get all these people on board to process the data and to implement it in the simulation uh, um, environment. This was basically, uh, I, I know you can't see anything on that slide, but that was the big uh, baseline that we have developed. Uh, so you see behind it uh, the business process modeling notation, which we have applied in order to depict how the uh, process of such a mass evacuation does look like, which are the, the um, actors which are involved in this task, and, and how there are the interrelations between each of those processes. Um, so, um, and I can tell you that actually th this was already quite a lot of information we got, um, but um, we could still go further. So the, the big question was also, you know, to define the degree of detail you really target, you need in order to, to work in this kind of environment. 
Um, so here you see the, um, the uh, front end, uh, which has been shown to the practitioners, where they actually beforehand could configure and say, for instance, um, I want this part of the city to be evacuated, and they have potential uh, places, the so-called uh, internally displaced persons camps, IDP camps, um, around those places. And all these places have not been known before uh, by those practitioners. So we were asking for, okay, what would be possible? So, you know, if you, if you are a crisis management practitioner, a first responder, you can say, okay, look, there is a gym. We can store those people there for a while if it's just for two or three days, but you would never think in advance before. Here they did so. Um, and so what you see is basically um, the pure simulation of uh, one certain configuration, which was done by those practitioners, the red circles are so uh, um, kind of the uh, waiting queues of people who were waiting for transports organized by the uh, city authorities. And we have to say, we were only looking at 20% of the population because that was the thing that we have learned from our interviews that basically uh, eight out of 10 people do not uh, use this kind of public uh, service, but they prefer to travel by themselves, by cars, with families, and so on and so forth. So quite an uh, interesting uh, thing. And the green uh, circles you see, this is actually um, the IDP camps. Uh, and that was also interesting, you know, from, from our logistician perspective, we know if we have such an IDP camp, we have to know how many people go there. Um, how, how is it possible to give all of them a bed so that they can... Uh, stay there for quite a while. Also, do they need some food? Do they need some, some water to drink and to calculate all this stuff? So that was all the information that the simulation uh, um, uh, model was able to produce um, and which was later on uh, applied uh, or let's say processed by the uh, practitioners. And now comes the interesting part and that's something that we should discuss so when it comes down to the assessment of it. So normally, if, if, if there are some uh, of you, I, I'm pretty sure there are uh, people who are using, for instance, simulation, in the IS research, we do have a good practices on how to evaluate this kind of simulation. And we basically ask whether we do simulate the right thing and whether we simulate in the right way. So that's the two questions which we use to evaluate the results. That's something that we are useful to. What we were not used to was actually this year that we have, we had to, so what I was talking about is basically something that is the solution dimension. So we of course asked uh, practitioners also in standard approaches um, how did you perceive, uh, for instance, a, a, a certain function, a certain feature of the solution? Um, but what we, um, what we had uh, to do here was basically to connect a certain um, perception of the solution with the actual objective, um, um, let's say, operational performance that the practitioners have. So to put it in, in, a, in a simple sentence, did the... Um, simulation lead to any improvements when it comes to managing this amount of people who need to be evacuated. And uh, I just I just prepared a, a, a short extract of the evaluation form. So on the left, you see, for instance, um, a, a feature-based assessment, which was only coming from the solution dimension, which was not looking at the operational performance. Um, and on the right-hand side, you see a quote of the trial owners who uh, were looking at each of those dimensions um, and to find out um, whether there was a relation with a certain um, operational change in the per, uh, crisis management performance uh, compared to the perception of the solution. So you can imagine that both is uh, possible. So you can you can have a solution that is perceived quite well, but you can also in, uh, imagine that uh, even if it's perceived well, highly usable and so on and so forth, but has no effect or even negative effect of the per, uh, operational performance. So, but next to this, there were so much other things uh, discovered. So for instance, um, intuitive simulation applications uh, uh, were discarded, but new application approaches were discovered by the practitioners. So we, for instance, planned this kind of simulation approaches for rather preparedness, but we were asked to apply it in a response phase, which was really new to us. So one thing that we came up and are currently working on is to, to analyze this kind of simulation application as speculative simulation. So nothing analytical, nothing uh, uh, concrete. Uh, so they, the reason was because they were driven by the practitioners. They have seen that's what the solution is able to do, and this is what they would like to do with it. Um, and this mixed research approach um, might be harsh or difficult to understand sometimes um, by the designers, by the, those who were creating the solutions, uh, but it also enabled new perspectives to the designers. So on the needs, the practitioners' realities, and the way how social technical systems should be developed, not for the users, as we often hear, 
but together with the users, simply because the users are the system. So they are they are the system that we are modeling or are trying to, to depict there. Okay, so before going to the to the discussion, there were two things that I would like really to leave here, and I, and I hope they are encouraging to you to also do uh, these kind of you know practitioner centered uh, um, approaches in your uh, um, IS search. One is to deal with innovations, and um, um, our driver plus mission was to support practitioners in finding relevant innovations. And the main message from this picture here is basically that. Um, for those who have been in the Netherlands, they know that in the in the dunes in the Netherlands there are free cows. So and you won't find many free animals uh, in this area here. So whenever people know about it, they go to the dunes and try to search for them, and they always you know uh, suffer to find them. And that's a little bit like with the innovations. You know they are somewhere out there. You search and search and you can't find them. And once you give up searching they appear right in front of you, so that maybe your eyes have seen them before, but your brain did not realize. And we, find quite, uh, we found quite some surprising and interesting outcomes. So the gap between designers and practitioners is a serious issue in IS research, but it can be bridged in so many ways. And this driver plus approach was just one way to do so. And another thing that I would like to leave with you is to think yeah, in a theoretical and maybe philosophical way. So as you probably have read uh, uh, the work uh, from Thomas Kuhn on the paradigm shift, so from, uh, what is it, 1960 something, so the structure of scientific revolutions. So he came up that um, science guided by one paradigm would be incommensurable with science developed under a different paradigm, by which is meant that there is no common measure for assessing the different scientific theories. And the question is whether we probably see something like a paradigm shift ahead of us. Well, we don't know. We will learn. I think that the, the COVID uh, time is something that is certainly giving a new drive into this kind of uh, um, uh, new drive into this kind of as assessment. And um, yeah, that's the last words I would I would like to leave here. And um, yeah, thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Hey, Adam. Thank you very much for the great presentation. It was really good to see the driver plus uh, project. And also the yeah, the interaction with the practitioners was really really good. I think we tried for a long time, uh, at least with Daniel, uh, while we were doing our research. It was a very tough task, and uh, I kind of can say that you you guys reached a very uh, like, let's say like a very uh, top level on this interaction, which is really really good. And uh, yeah, so I should want to say the questions for of you. Uh, people are reminding us there in chat that Adam has promised to give the link for the video. So if you can write down the link there at the chat, people will be very thankful. It's coming. It's coming. Amazing. I, I have a first question uh, uh, before you get to the Mentimeter questions uh, there is, I mean, uh, I see all this involvement of practitioners there. How could you get them involved so so? well in, in, in a, an academic uh, venture, let's say, because we usually, that's where we struggle, right? We, we have all these great plans, these great ideas, but when we get to the practitioners, they either think that we are too theoretical or, or they are too practical and they have to do things right away and they don't have time for, for, for the planning that we would like them to be involved with. Great question. So I think what you are already used to do being um, convincing to participate because that's that's for a reason so we are not doing this for ourselves but we are doing it for a, you know a, a bigger objective if you want so um, and I think that's something that we uh, really had to to uh, uh, keep on trying to be very honest so but also um, and I think that was the uh, biggest uh, um, added value for the driver plus project they were direct beneficiaries of those uh, of this project so um, the organizations were able to say, okay, two guys of our team will be only working on this research and development project because we are interested in, in increasing the preparedness. And I, it is, maybe it's a little bit materialistic to say that, but I think it's, it's really do, uh, it's, no, it's necessary simply because of the fact doing research is not the core activity and core competence of uh, um, um, lifesaver, if you want so. They want to, to be first responders in the first place. And we had many discussions. I, I remember so many discussions where they said like, okay, I, please leave me alone. Uh, but then there were still those two guys who were, you know, they were our helpers, our advocates, if you, if you want so. You're muted. 
I'm always trying to find a button to press here and it keeps escaping. It seems that it goes this way and I try to press it and it comes this way. <laughs> uh, no, what I was going to say, you, you definitely needed a, uh, what we, we what our literature usually says, you need a champion, right? You need someone that is inside the organization that believes that what you're trying to do is going to be worth them putting their effort into it as well. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, oh, we already have the link there. Mm -hmm. I will save the link for myself. Okay, so um, we have six questions so far. Uh, the first one, I think that uh, Alexander already uh, asked it, right? So what are the what are your strategies to get uh, practitioners involved? That was actually my question. Yeah. yeah. But if I may, because I don't know if this came from you, Alexander, um, what I would li maybe like to add, there is one thing that, uh, and I think I have been challenged with this difficulty already like 10 years ago, um, by a practitioner who said, like, you researchers, please stop sending me requests to participate in project proposal or uh, giving interviews or whatever. I don't have the time for it. Um, and if you do so, please communicate between each other so that you consolidate what you, what you want to know. And um, I think that um, every one of us kind of contributes to this, um, uh, to this phenomenon, whether, whether things are working fine or not so fine. Uh, and um, that's that would be my message here, just on top of this. So if we don't, if you don't have such a project, so that you have this, how did you call it, Alexander, uh, like a, a game champion who who is in charge and who can uh, mobilize these practitioners, uh, we every one of us contributes somehow to the trust within the crisis management practitioners or the practitioners in general, uh, how they perceive researchers uh, approaching them. Good. Uh, so you can you can pick one of them, other feel free to do it, or we can I can just select one randomly and whatever you want. Okay, so let's go for this one here. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's what are the challenges of evaluating uh, AS IS artifacts with practitioners? Do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Um, oh. I'm not muted. Okay, uh, so the, I think that challenges of evaluating IS artifacts is, are, um, are manifold, um, and I think that it always de uh, depends a little bit on the perspective. So, from the researcher perspective, what you uh, um, what you see is basically that um, you know sometimes, for instance, if you have a, a simulation like we developed, um, there is always a simulation model behind it. And whenever something occurs in the, in the, in the simulation outputs, people can say like, ah, this result I don't like, I don't think it's realistic. And then you have to somehow explain. And that's not always easy. Um, it is important to find a common language, I would say, um, in being clear about what is the question and what is an appropriate answer. So that's the one thing. But I think that what I have also experienced is the, the other way around. So what are the challenges of uh, practitioners with us researchers? And I think that's exactly the same thing. So if there is a researcher starting to argue about what is inside of the, of the model, um, this is probably not uh, what the practitioners want to hear. So I would say, um, and there is a great article about that from uh, uh, Luke van Wassenhofer um, and another guy, which name I forgot, about finding a common language. So we also had a common terminology, which we developed in Driver, so that everyone was clear about what we are talking about. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Sometimes when you try to, I'm not saying about uh, disaster agencies, but when you try to, you know, engage with practitioners from the from companies, software developing companies, or this kind of uh, of, of stakeholders, it's kind of difficult to put people on the same page. And uh, I also found the quite interesting when you when you actually develop or build this like uh, like the same terms, and uh, and then you can you clearly. Uh, the exchange ideas and the exchange discussions, improve the discussions and so forth. So uh, I agree with you. So I think in the same way, uh, there is one question here, which is the, uh, okay, so you mentioned about simulation, right? And uh, do you have any comments on the uh, research methods? Because uh, I know, I, at least I, I will leave you, I will give you. So do you have any comments on the research methods uh, that you can uh, employ to interact with the practitioners? You mentioned already simulations, but you have any others? Yes, so um, basically the, the um, artifacts which we have developed. So we had a double role in Driver Plus, which was one being the developer of the methodology and some, some other things, but also we had our own products which we wanted to, yeah, to share with the community. Um, 
And the when it comes uh, to the uh, question on um, what kind of methods we really apply, so what what helped me quite well was something that is a little bit more hands-on when you compare it to, for instance, design science research. So design science research is something that we always look at because it very well defines on you know how to run the relevance cycle, how to run the rego cycle. Um, but one thing that turned out for me as quite interesting and impressive was certainly action research, um, because uh, the, there is something in the center of, of action research, which is the uh, um, client um, uh, system infrastructure, if I'm not wrong, um, where you create this kind of trust, where you develop your own language, where you develop something like a progress. And that was very helpful uh, for our team, because we always, what we did was basically, you know, we found a problem, um, we, we researched a bit, uh, tried to find a solution, then we um, uh, developed this solution, showed it to the practitioners, and we learned what worked well and what did not work so well, and we started again. And this circle was very, very helpful. But there are, of course, other, other works like you know, ethnographic uh, um, uh, field research is, is, is quite impressive, uh, but I have not that much experience on that. So what, what I would definitely highlight here, um, design science as a general framework, if you want so, and action research as a really you know, trust-building method that helps you to, to, to get one, one group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember design science when I was living in Münster, right? A lot of people were using it. And uh, mm. I think I think the method grew a lot since the last I think five or four years. A lot of people from uh, from the not only from IS but also from uh, software engineering, which is actually one of my research fields of research, they have been using this idea of uh, time science. So it's really good. And you also mentioned national time research, which is also uh, another quite interesting method that you can actually use. Uh, but this is more longitudinal kind of studies, right? So you have to engage a little bit. Uh, engage a little bit more with the company, uh, so in which you can kind of track the chains throughout the time and this kind of stuff, uh, which is really good, it's really good. Uh, yeah, so let's go for the next one. Uh, okay, so this one might be a little bit different. Can we apply the driver plus framework in plans to a company as a bank? Okay, now I think a, a careful answer is needed. So um, I think, yes, you, you can apply this kind of framework um, as long as, as you um, acknowledge that the target audience is a different one. So for instance, the language we have used for the uh, trial guidance methodology handbook was very practical hands-on. You will probably find other profiles of uh, uh, professions in a bank so that you can uh, be a little bit more formal, for instance. Maybe this kind of formality is even helpful for that. But in general, I think when it comes to um, thinking of, okay, what do we need in order to uh, foster innovation? And we said, okay, we need a methodology, we need a technical setup, and then we need something like, uh, for instance, organizational structures. I think this is transferable. But I would never say it's generalizable because it's, it's really like the, the handbook was really the result of this particular uh, uh, trials in crisis management question, but doing trials in other domains, I think there is this could be this could be definitely applicable. And I would love to hear uh, about uh, whoever asked this question, your experiences, if you, if you suggest something like that to a bank. But I think that the bank should be happy because it it would be more um, you know application and added value oriented rather than theoretical. And I think that's that's a winning factor. Good, good. Uh, mm, cool. Okay, so COVID-19, do you believe that frameworks to manage pandemic will be released after COVID-19? Yeah, so um, I think I can say it for Europe. Um, and here I am, I am uh, very, very sure about this. Um, um, maybe just one, you know, follow-up information. So we are currently in two other projects involved as a direct uh, contributor um, using this trial guidance methodology. And one of them is only at uh, um, pandemic management um, in uh, the European countries and, uh, you know, looking into uh, how innovations can be assessed in this, uh, um, uh, in this area. And what, what I can see there is that we, so the project started on 1st of October, 
we have, I think, from 12 European countries, uh, practitioner organizations there involved both from national planners, but also first responders. And what they started doing right now is actually exactly what you're asking for. Creating um, pandemic management, which, is, which goes beyond what is known. Because, for instance, now the interrelations between a school and the health authority of, of, uh, of an area is much more you know, clear how connected they are. So um, I, I, am, I, I would say yes. Yeah, okay. Over. Okay, so next one. Uh, yeah, I think this one is nice. How can we incorporate research contributions within organizations? So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this very much also, yeah, no, I'm not, not, not muted. Um, what, what I would say is it's really about, uh, you know, the sustainability plans you have with your project and um, a project can be a pure research project it can be an applied research project but i think that this is something that is important so whenever so for instance in my uh, uh, study so the 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 PhD work which, uh, uh, which i was involved in um it was a project which helped me to create trust uh, trust within the organization and that was something that i could in the end see as an as a very interesting output so that was the incorporation in an organization so that they took it up after i left and I think that's that's really something that is uh, satisfactory for for researchers. Um, but there is really there is a lot of variables which we cannot control. So everything that we can do is basically um, to uh, yeah um, to be committed to what we are doing um, and to um, try to establish trust as much as we can. Um, over. Yeah. Okay. I think this one is related as well, Adam. So. How do you see the interplay between theory and practice and how can the researchers of information systems approach? And how can we, researchers of information systems, approach this delivery of something that adds value to the society? Okay, you know, since now it is half past 9 p.m. here, I, I, I think I can get a little bit more, uh, um, yeah, maybe not philosophical, but maybe yes. I think it has something to do with this, with the academic system we are living in. Um, so I, I think uh, everyone here in, in the call uh, has certain realities to face, you know, to finish a thesis um, uh, or to, you know, conclude a project, to find another one, to apply for a professor uh, position and so on and so forth. And, and that is probably in, in um, uh, the contrary of uh, trying to look at how, um, you know, you write in this question the term delivery and, you know, for, for a logistics researcher, it's something, okay, I deliver, I, I, I have something for you and I give it to you and it's, and it's yours now and I go. And in order to do so, we need probably more than one or two papers in a high rank journal and, and uh, the, the, you know, um, the, the finalization of a thesis. What we need there is probably something that actually the uh, society is looking for, you know, something that they can apply, that they can pick up. And that's why, for instance, the driver project was so interesting for me, like personally, simply uh, because the, the uh, requirements or the expectations from the practitioner sides were like, OK, but your solution has to work. It's live depending on it. So if, if, if I implement the solution in my daily work and it fails, uh, it's human who might suffer from that. So, uh, and, you know, and, you know, and that's, that's the opposite of, of a thesis or of a high rate uh, paper. So sometimes um, maybe the um, objectives or the, 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 um, the principles that we are looking at uh, when doing research are not very much aligned with how to deliver things um, to an added value of, of our societies. It, it is a balance that we have to, every one of us has to find an individual answer for. Over. Great, great. So maybe the last one would be this. So in a government plan, uh, private companies have any role in the crisis management? Yeah. So um, that's a tricky question. So I, I, um, I would not dare to answer this question uh, um, uh, generally. Um, but uh, for those organizations which we work with in Europe, it is certainly the case. So I have found it in, in the Netherlands quite quite strongly when it comes to, for instance, information systems providers. Um, so maybe you have heard about the, um, the German Corona tracking app. 
um, that was something that, you know, uh, there are two companies, which you probably know. One is SAP, the other one is Telecom. Uh, so they never worked on uh, crisis management systems. I mean, no, they did, I'm sorry. Um, sorry, SAP, sorry, Telecom, they did so. But they were never known as, you know, experts for crisis management. But when it came to this tracking app, there were so many security legal issues and also the, the, the call for reliable um, supplier where the government simply said, okay, but those people, we know those assets, we know those capacities and they can deal with it. And based on that, they played a major role. And it was, I think, a 60 million euro deal in total for those two companies, um, which is quite expensive. Um, so here you see uh, quite strongly like how important it is. Um, but even if you think about, you know, logistics service providers uh, when looking at, um, I don't know, humanitarian operations, that's quite important because people cannot afford to, to you know, to rent a, a, an airplane uh, in order to deliver something to uh, to the scene. So yes, I think they play an important role. And this, uh, so we are talking here also about, you know, several uh, specific requirements to this kind of collaborations, um, public-private partnership, um, and that's quite, quite, an, quite an important um, aspect in our uh, day's life. Over. Yeah, I remember, I remember that I met one guy, in, uh, you were at the East Grim 2018, right? In uh, Rochester, or not? Uh, yeah, so there, there was this guy, uh, I think his name was Clark something, and he, he used to work to, uh, do you remember this guy? He used to work to I, Amazon. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he worked to Amazon, and Amazon has this department, which is, uh, which is a crisis management or a humanitarian uh, department for providing uh, AWS for for data storage and also for uh, uh, for deploying systems and uh, providing this technology infrastructure for uh, crisis response. And yes, yeah, so it's a private company, and they have they. I think they will play a very big role in the future, made in these companies, right? Because they have the old all the infrastructure, they have the telecom, uh, you know, role for sharing data and allowing data to be shared with different people. And yeah, so I agree with you. It is, it is really good. Uh, I'm not sure here in Brazil it's going to work, but uh, yeah, we might we might have something in the future uh, happening on this kind of uh, uh, here in Brazil at least. And it's a great example, Flavio. Thanks for, for reminding it. So actually, uh, in, in another project, we are working on uh, pandemic simulation. Um, and uh, basically, what, what we developed there was a simulation tool that is, helps us to measure the interventions, to, to understand whether a lockdown makes sense or makes no sense. Um, and uh, for there, we, for instance, uh, have used the mobility data from, uh, um, from Google, which was so exciting because, I, I mean, our governmental services did not have this data, but this private company had. Uh, and that was so obvious. And, and you know, in this in this sense, uh, Google was also quite helpful with, with sharing it. So providing a proper API so that you can uh, uh, work with this data. And um, I think within uh, um, it was within days that people started to implement those solutions uh, um, in their models. And th that was, really, I think, a, a very nice example of how things can work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's uh, yeah. So private companies, mainly these ones, they have to at least put in the front of the others and uh, yeah, start to share in their infrastructure because uh, at least for the for the pandemic, imagine the volume of data you have to process, right? For the mobility and uh, processing all this data from Google, and you have to merge, integrate with different data and come up with the insights. That's a lot, and I think only Google, Microsoft, these big tech companies, they have the infrastructure to support us in this kind of task. Yeah, and besides, Flavio, I think uh, it's more than time that societies, uh, that our, our societies uh, demands that these companies become really responsible. And in fact, that they, they should plan in advance to help because they have data that nobody else has. We give the, them this data for free, right? But they have to make very uh, sensible use of it if, uh, if they are to be not just a for-profit thing, but also companies that we as a society are proud of having around. Otherwise, uh, it's better not to give them all this data uh, anyway. I could not agree more. Uh, OK, well, thank you very much. Adam. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has a question that was not there in our mentee, uh, if you just want to open your mic. Uh, otherwise, we at the end of each of our presentations, we always ask people at least to open their cameras so that we can shoot a nice picture together with our presenter of the day. right? So if you still have a question, please come forward. Otherwise, please open your, your cameras, those ones who, who can, so that we take a picture here. And so that Adam knows who he was talking to, right? 
From our end here, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Adam, for making the time. And yeah, uh, I have to thank you. And whenever, if, if you have a question afterwards, please do not hesitate to, to, give, to write me an email. I'm, uh, as, you, as you know, we are the, the arm of the uh, you know, uh, part here in, in Europe, which is closely collaborating with uh, South American uh, uh, partners. So please feel free to, to contact me. Also, if you want to visit Münster as a postdoc or a researcher, a master's student, we have quite a lot of opportunities in Minnesota. Great, thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Okay, see you guys. See you guys. Week. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. I mean, this is a very lonely situation in which uh, we, we're usually talking to a camera, right? Uh, it's good to have at least someone at the other side nodding at us and so that we know, yes, uh, some, something is happening here. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, thanks for everyone who was doing this during the talk. I, I fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's, uh, it's, this is something that we did not learn during this pandemic. We, hopefully, we do not need a second one to learn that an open camera, uh, although we, we mainly here in Latin America, we have all sorts of problems with infrastructure. So many of these people that did not have their cameras open, did not have their cameras open because if the camera is open, then the sound is bad. You will see in the chat that there were lots of people complaining about the quality of the sound. And uh, so we, we, we do all sorts of tricks to get some message uh, through, right? But see that many of them have opened their cameras. Again, I will ask uh, the same as I ask every time, right? We will all print screen, and I always have the, the problem of print screening and looking at the camera. Uh, but uh, what I want you to do as well is that you also take your screen, your, your print screens, and you you share it with your friends. We need next week is our 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 last uh, event of this series of seminars, and we want uh, to have as many people there uh, as possible to celebrate those 65 years of practice and research of this colleague of ours who's so happy to be around uh, and who, who even wants to notice someone that has such an experience asking, could we rehearse it on Monday so that I'm sure that everything is going to work fine on, on, on Wednesday? I thought that was really cute. I hope everyone is around on Wednesday to see our uh, surprise guest uh, talking about 65 years of research and practice in IS. Right. Next week we have uh, a presentation of this guy who has been around in the information systems field for, well, Flavio said over 50 years last week. I did a little more research on it. It's, it's over 65 years, six, over 65 years of research in information systems. And he will be with us. Uh, it's a surprise. I'm not going to tell you who it is for now. Maybe some of you already have an idea because there aren't many people that have, have been around for, for that long and, and are still active. Uh, but uh, he's so uh, keen on doing this speech to us that he, he told me that, well, he confessed to me, you know, I'm not very good with these new technologies. And I said, come on, you're an IS guy, right? So he's going to rehearse it with me on Monday, right? Uh, just to make sure that he knows the right buttons to, to press. So feel, uh, not only feel free to be here, but please invite any of your students, uh, your colleagues, other researchers, because this is going to be also a one in a lifetime opportunity of uh, talking to, to, well, to, experiencing, hearing from this guy, talking about what he's seen uh, in, in the information systems field since the, the, the time when he started uh, uh, as a practitioner in the field over 65 years ago.